Morning, everyone. Jim Laird here from uh, sunny Largo, Florida. Maybe I'm getting used to things, but it just doesn't seem as muggy anymore. So it's actually a pretty, pretty nice morning. Went for my morning walk with with uh, with Rommel, my dog, and uh, that's always always nice. Try to walk really early in the morning when it's cool here, and go for a couple walks during the day, particularly the evening after dinner. Doctor Stillman has a HTMA. Uh, course he's going to be releasing at the end of this month. If you'd like to learn more about that course, go in the description below, click on his link tree. He'll have a link to the HTMA uh, in there. Click on that, enter your information. You'll get all the information. Um, you can also find the live webinar he's going to be doing at the end of the month under lives on YouTube. Um, I am adding, we have a course called the Fundamentals of Wellness, which we go through all basic fundamentals that we teach everyone, regardless of whether they're in the medical practice or the coaching practice. We have monthly Q and A's. Um, as we add more people, we're going to add more Q and A's uh, to help provide you support, troubleshoot, product, provide accountability. Because a lot of times people know what they need to do, but they don't actually do it. So it's a way for us to interact with you and get to know you and get to know your individual context so we can kind of customize things for you. And um, I'm adding a strength training component to it. So if you're, especially if you're a beginner, I'm, I'm really good at, at, at two things. I'm really good at introducing beginners to strength training that, that, uh, that works for them. Uh, and, and generally their goals are just to look good and feel good. And I'm really good at, at helping people that have kind of painted themselves into a corner um, with their training, kind of overcome either doing too much or not having enough um, options in their training, so to speak. It's got to kind of help people reorganize. That's, that's two things I'm really good at. My first Q&A is actually this Saturday. Uh, what's today? Thursday, day after tomorrow. I believe I'm doing it at 11 a.m. Eastern. So if you sign up for the Fundamentals of Wellness, you can get in on that Q&A. And I'm going to be able to customize the course and customize everything for, for your needs, essentially. That's what those Q&As will be all about. Those will be recorded. They'll be posted in the course. And there's a link to the Fundamentals of Wellness in the description below if you want to get in on that. Um, if you message me, if you're interested, you message me I'll, uh, on Instagram or drop me an email at Jim Laird. Um, at stillmanwellness.com, I'll, I'll send you a discount code. You can get 10% off. So that being said, the topic to today's discussion, the most important thing you need to know about health and where a lot of people kind of go wrong. They don't really understand this principle. This principle like really applies to everything in life, you know, whether it's relationships, whether it's movement, breathing, training, and it's a concept of variability or options, okay? Um, and you got to start thinking about things in terms of trade-offs, right? So if we look at like two cars, if we look at a Camry and we look at a top fuel dragster, you know, and, and the fastest top fuel dragsters now are actually running the quarter mile in less time than it would take if you dropped the dragster a quarter mile. I, I can't remember the exact times, but it, it's... It's ridiculously insane. If you're watching this and, and you want to Google like the fastest quarter mile time for a dragster, that'd be great. I, I know Camry's probably somewhere in the like, you know, 15, 16 seconds or, or something like that, maybe 17 seconds, depending on the type of camera you have. In order for that top fuel dragster to run that quarter mile at the insane speeds that they're running them at, which it's just absolutely ludicrous. Like, you know, 30 years ago, like a 12 second, you know, 11 second, 10 second quarter mile was, was ridiculous. Now they're running it in like absolutely insane times, but they're going over 300 miles an hour in a, in a quarter mile, which is absolutely sick. Um, I'm a, I'm a total gearhead, by the way, if you didn't know that, but um, in order to, to be able to run that quarter mile, you give up comfort. Okay. You're basically locked into this, tiny cockpit um there's there's no real comfort there's a safety cage to keep you from like dying if you you crash you have these little bitty wheels in the front that barely turn um so a lot of times they have to push the car in order to steer it and get it where it needs to go big massive tires in the in the back um they have to rebuild the engine often because it's under so much force under so much torque uh you know we're talking thousands and thousands of horsepower 
you know, running highly flammable explosive fuels. Um, so there's absolutely no practicality. You give up steering, you give up comfort, you give up distance in order to run that quarter mile super fast. Now the Camry, it can't run a quarter mile as fast, but it's comfortable. It gets great fuel economy. You can drive across the country in it. It steers really well. It handles really well. Um, it's a Toyota, very reliable because it's not a high performance machine. You just change the oil and basically nothing ever goes wrong. If you've ever owned a Toyota, there's a couple small exceptions, but if you've ever owned a Toyota, you know, you basically just change the oil, you change the brakes and it runs forever, right? Super reliable, but it's not, you know, you start getting into Lamborghinis and McLarens and BMWs and things like that with twin turbos, things tend to break a lot more. So you tend to give things up to have certain things. Like, you know, if you want a super fancy luxury car, you're probably going to spend a lot more money. You know, if you do the brakes on a Camry, you're looking at probably a couple hundred dollars. You do the brakes on a five series BMW, you're looking at a thousand dollars a wheel, right? So that's the trade-off. Um, the same thing goes for something like blood pressure. Okay. This principle goes to blood pressure. High blood pressure is nor good or bad. It's situational. So if I'm chasing you with a machete, blood pressure is amazing. Okay. You raise your blood pressure. You throw your head back. You run really fast to get away from me. Who's chasing you with a machete. And if you can get like 20 yards ahead of me, uh, you know, from the start, you, you got a good shot, but I'm, I'm a lot faster than people think, especially in short distances. So you get away from me and then you relax and that blood pressure comes back down eventually, right? Um, low blood pressure is bad if I'm chasing you with a machete. Low blood pressure is great if you're trying to go to sleep. So when you get into trouble is you lose the ability to switch between low and high blood pressure, okay? We can carry this over into food, right? Um, you should be able to fast and you should be able to eat a bunch of starch and be okay and not, you know, have issues either way. And that's metabolic flexibility. When you lose the ability to have metabolic flexibility, that's when you tend to run into things like diabetes and, and other issues that are blood sugar related. Um, so all these things um, have their time and place and people tend to get stuck on one side or the other, right? And they can't move back and forth. And, and that's when you get into trouble. Um, the same thing goes for breathing. You know, everybody talks about breathing. Okay. So you lay somebody on the floor. How, sh what does a normal breathing pattern look like? Well, it's circumferential expansion through the entire rib cage. So when you breathe in the rib cage expands 360 front to back side to side rib cage and belly expand. A lot of people lose the ability to expand their rib cage or they have a stiff rib cage or they are, have a compressed rib cage so that belly they pooch the belly and all that air and pressure goes out okay so we want the rib cage to expand and then we want it to contract okay we want it to expand we want it to contract and that helps draw air in and it helps push air out where people get into trouble, most people, you'll put them on their back, you'll tell them to take a breath, and the ribs will go up, and the neck, you know, they'll try and arch off the floor, okay? This is a this is a, a compensatory strategy or a high threshold strategy. That would be compared to the I'm chasing you with a machete strategy. Not, not a bad strategy if you're being chased by a bear, but not a great strategy if that's what you're just chilling, sitting here. If I'm sitting here and I'm over breathing and I'm having to breathe by, you know, using my neck, my lats, um, you know, that sort of thing, instead of being able to just breathe normally and, and, and calmly, that has ramifications, affects digestion, affects hormones, it affects the way you move. When you're in this extended state, you have less movement options through the hips, through the shoulders. So being able to turn off and breathe with a more relaxed strategy at the appropriate time is super important. Same goes for lifting weights, okay? If you're always pulling your shoulder blades together and you're arching hard and you're constantly reinforcing that pattern and you don't have the ability to relax, flex your spine, you get stuck in this strategy of, an, of, you know, of being jammed into extension. You lose the ability to move in certain ways. You get compressed. And then, you know, if you can't shut that off after you're done, we end up with people that are walking around jamming 
their spine together to essentially get their stability. And that, that's, that's just a generalization. There's different manifestations of this. If you look somebody like I am a wide, the widest of the wide infrasternal angles, which means my, my rib cage literally goes like that. Okay. Um, Bill Hartman, who's a, a mentor of mine for many, many years. If you ever check Bill out, um, it, it, your head will hurt for, for months uh, when you first start listening to him because he has his, his own little lingo. And, I, and I've been watching Bill. I, I, I'm not even on the same planet when it comes to technicality and things, but I'm able to listen to him and watch him and, and, and draw information from it and apply it to, to people in my own unique way. But, um, but Bill's language, when you, if you start watching him, um, he does a, a coaching call every, every Thursday morning for free. Um, and if you get on those calls, um, you, your head will hurt for a little while, but if you kind of stick with it and kind of learn his lingo, uh, he, he probably has one of the most complete models that makes sense to me that, I, that I've ever seen from anyone. But um, if, if you listen to him talk, he talks about trade-offs, right? And strategy and, and how, being able to choose the right strategy at the right time. And so a lot of times when you work with people, when you, when you have that compression strategy, that arch strategy, it allows you to produce a ton of force. So my body is set up to produce a lot of force. I'm not designed to turn well, whereas my 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 counter my colleague who's traveling today, Dr. Stillman, has a really narrow infrasternal angle. His rib cage is straight up, which is going to allow more rotation. He's going to struggle with force production and things like that. I have a tendency to get stuck here, extended. So I do a lot of backwards bear crawls. You know, I squat with a safety squat bar. Uh, I do things to help get that stack in place so that my hips operate uh, in a uh, in a more efficient way. I have more options, okay? Now, if I wanted to do a powerlifting meet or push strength again, I would probably have to resort to some of those strategies that, you know, get that stability. When you're a power lifter, you want less options. You want to be like a fire hydrant so you can produce the most amount of force possible, right? So that's why training selection matters. If you're working with a golfer, developing that fire hydrant strategy is probably not a good idea or a baseball player or somebody who has overhead athlete. You want them to be able to move through the thorax and through the shoulder blades. You want to be able to rotate, right? And a lot of it goes to, do you have the right body for the sport? Obviously, if you're a wide infrasternal angle, you're trying to play sports that require a lot of rotation, probably not going to work out well for you. And usually the, the, um, you know, there's a reason why all the high level athletes tend to look the same in the sport. If you look at swimmers, they all tend to look the same because they have a body that tends to be good at that thing. We tend to chase things that we're good at as opposed to trying to do things we suck at. Like I would be a horrible rock climber. Uh, I would be a horrible swimmer. I actually worked with a lady the other day. Some of the most credible athletes are like synchronized swimming is just like I can't even like fathom what that would be like. Like I, I have a hard time just floating because I sink to the bottom. Like when I go snorkeling and things, I got to wear a one life jacket on my chest and another one around my, my ass because my legs just <clears throat> take me down like a boat anchor. Uh, the, the idea of like being able to tread water upside down and lift yourself out of the water in a, in what looks like a really smooth controlled manner is just beyond my comprehension. Right. So pretty interesting stuff. And, and a lot of people don't understand your body type, your genetics, the parents you have are going to basically determine what you're good at and what you're bad at. And I don't care how hard you work at something, you might be able to do it, but you're not going to be able to perform it at a high level if you don't have the appropriate structure. Like there's probably not going to be anybody from Nepal. Uh, the, if you've ever been to Nepal, especially up in the mountains, these little, little tiny people, uh, they're probably never, ever going to play in the NBA unless they start an NBA league for only Nepal people, right? They're just, that's just not something, but you know, you take Shaquille O'Neal and you're trying to get him up in the high latitude or the high altitudes in Nepal. He's probably not going to function very well. So also we get back to the infrasternal angle stuff. Somebody like Dr. Stillman has a narrow infrasternal angle. He's squished front to back. He has a hard time expanding front to back in his rib cage. That's one of the reasons why people that have narrow infrasternal angles end up with this sway back or they have this little pooch at the bottom that isn't necessarily fat. That's pressure coming down because they can't expand through the rib cage. So there's things we can do to put them in divisions where they can restore that expansion of the rib cage. And then there's exercises we can do in their training program 
that actually help them open up and manage that as opposed to some of the exercises which are more traditional strength training exercises which are really designed just to produce more strength and force will sometimes make people like that worse so there's ways that you can implement certain exercises to actually help people not get pushed further down the path that they're already on we, we don't want to take someone like me and do more extension-based exercises for somebody like me who doesn't turn and rotate i'm going to want to be doing things that make me shift and you know rotate enough and you know when i work with with power lifters people like that getting them to like round over a stability ball and breathe after they're done to get them some flexion so they can breathe a little better is super important and then and then people with narrower infasternal angles making sure we're not doing things that are going to compress them even more um, getting things that open up their rib cage ex- get them to expand front to back there's ways that you can add things into um, training programs that don't basically bury people and, and that's where you get into like the art and the the uh, it's such an art working with someone who's a high level performer because high level performers, I always compare to like walking on a tightrope, right? You're on this tightrope and, and the idea is, is not to fall off. And the margin between being healthy enough to perform and then not performing is very narrow. When you get to the really, really high level people, it's a really small margin. Um, so it, a lot of it is, is learning the art of giving the pe- people the things that they need uh, without taking away their performance like if you take Hussein Bolt and or like someone like Deion Sanders or an NBA player who is very explosive a lot of them will have like what they would call tight hamstrings but that tightness and that stiffness is allow was what allows them to be explosive and to create that force that's needed so if you start trying to take somebody who's a high level performer and you start trying to like fix their tightness you might take away the attribute that makes them really good at what they do. So if that makes sense, if you understand this concept of variability and having options, right? It's kind of like if you're dating somebody, right? And you're a dude and that girl that you're dating looks at you and says, man, this guy's let himself go. He's, he's getting kind of fat. He's not very motivated. He sits in his basement and he smokes weed and he plays video games all day. Doesn't have any ambition. All of a sudden, that girl's looking around and going, there's no other girls interested in my guy. And she kind of was like, nobody else wants to be with him. So I, I really don't know if I want to be with him either. Right. So she starts looking around going, oh, man, these other guys are taking really good care of themselves. They're in shape. You know, like this, this, I might, I might need to look somewhere else. So if you're a dude and lots of women are interested in you, right. This is kind of controversial, but that's okay. Um, a lot of women are interested in you, your significant other is probably going to have more interest in you as well, because she realizes that you might be able to go somewhere else. But if you're a guy and you've let yourself go and you're in a bad place and you don't have any other options, the chances are your significant other is probably going to lose attraction for you. So there's always great power in having options. It's the same for a job, right? If you work for somebody and that person knows that you could leave and get another job at any time somewhere else, they're going to value you a lot more. They're probably going to pay you a lot more. If you bring so much to the table that you're a really hard person to replace, they're going to do everything they can to keep you, especially if you're really good at sales, right? If you don't have other options, that that employer, the chances of them doing extraordinary things to keep you on the team goes down a lot more so this principle applies to everything from performance to health as soon as you start losing variability and losing options there are trade-offs right and sometimes we need to take options away for somebody who's a power lifter we're going to want to take away some of their mobility so they can produce more force but there comes a point where that has a consequence where they might get hurt because they're too into that strategy so it's really a, a an art form of managing um strategies and 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 uh options right and and that's why there's you know bodybuilding powerlifting you have off seasons you have on seasons you have you know phases where you specialize and you take things away and then you have phases where you you go back to general and that's one of the things that's really been lost in in our modern 
our modern training system is if you look at the Russians, they would map everything out and they'd be specific for a very short period of time. And then after their competition, they would decompress, like the weightlifters would get away from lifting. They would do some bodyweight gymnastic stuff, all this stuff they developed as a general base when they were young. And then they would do things like the Russian weightlifters would play ping pong, you know, kind of, you know, keep their nervous system working and athleticism. But they would get away from the specific training for weightlifting for a specific period of time, allow the body to normalize They'd come off their performance enhancing drugs. They'd allow their body to normalize and then they would go back into another training cycle. Most of the kids now, you know, they're playing soccer year round, the competitiveness of it. They never, ever get time off to decompress, allow their body to normalize, to develop different um, energy systems, to relax, to, 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 to decompress from mental stress. And they just go from, you know, if you, you know, soccer kids or volleyball kids, they go from one season to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And they never get a chance to switch off, to go to the other side of things. And that's where they end up, you know, getting into trouble. So if anybody has any questions for me, um, I'd be more happy to answer them. You can put them in the, in the comments. Um, please like and subscribe, hit the bell so that you get notified when we were on here. Uh, it's pretty cool because we're, we're live on Twitter. Uh, we're live on LinkedIn. Uh, we can't stream more than one LinkedIn. So uh, if you're on LinkedIn and you're seeing this, one day you'll have uh, have us on the feed on, on my channel. And then you'll have Dr. Stillman's channel the next day. We alternate back and forth and we're both on. Um... Well, yes, Amy, that is a great question. Breathing seems so natural. And if you look at the way babies breathe when they're on their back, um, you know, they expand circumferentially everywhere in and out. Right. And the babies play with their feet on the floor and they have that natural breathing pattern. That's uh, but yes, stress, modern life, I would say would be the biggest uh, indicator of. And also, like you get into if you study Weston A. Price, um, he looks at how jaws and face shape has changed. Uh, as we've added more refined food, you know, people like you look at traditional cultures that, that lived a traditional lifestyle. None of them had like teeth issues or um, wisdom teeth removed or anything like that because they had a really wide jaw because they chewed. They had a progression of going from breastfeeding to, the, you know, a lot of times the, the, the elders would chew the food up a little bit, the meat in particular, then give it to the child and the child would chew the food required more chewing so they develop wide jaws if you look at these 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 pictures of these people so if you end up with a narrow jaw the chances are you're going to end up being a, a more of an over breather um, when you're under chronic stress you tend to breathe through your mouth that's why we really remind people in the coaching practice if you're out and about if you're walking around in Publix or wherever you shop put the tongue in the roof of your mouth breathe through your nose and then that strategy you know when you get when you're when you get into this, this arch position, you know, I call it the JLo position, you tend to overbreathe. You breathe too much. Your, your diaphragm, because it can't move up and down as well because of the spinal position, um, it, you start breathing with your neck and your, your lats and you start getting tight through here. So a lot of that, and you get stuck in this loop and it leads to digestive issues, anxiety. If you look at overbreathing or mouth breathing, the, the side effects of that, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So getting people to, um, yeah, that's a great, that's a great, great read. You know, and, and the thing about it is, is with breathing, you don't hear too many people talking about how the shape of the exoskeleton affects the way you breathe. So if you're stuck in a position where you can't get the zone of apposition, you know, because you don't want to live in flexion and you don't want to live in extension. You want to live somewhere in the middle and then you choose the right strategy for the task, right? Um, if you can't get into that stacked position where that diaphragm can move up and down, it's going to be very difficult for you to breathe efficiently, right? So you're going to turn into an over breather, which basically you can't relax, right? And then people like, like me that are very extended have a hard time exhaling. Um, and then you have some people who can't inhale, like Dr. Stillman has a hard time inhaling because he's compressed front to back. And that puts him in a stress state because he's got anxiety because he can't breathe enough. Right. So you it, it kind of you end up getting stuck in this loop. And, we'll, you know, we'll have people in the practice that will try and do breathing drills 
but they can't really do them well until we change the shape of their skeleton. We change the shape of their axial skeleton. Uh, you know, a really simple one, especially for extended people, is just having them round over a stability ball, open that upper back up, get the guts and the air to move into the upper back, um, and then doing things like people that are narrow, that are compressed front to back, something like a modified child's pose where their knees are together, their butts pushed all the way back to their heels, their hands are overhead, but without arching, they're rounded slightly, so the rib cage is in good position, and then they're able to drive the guts, force that pressure up and they're able to expand the rib cage front to back so that's a really good way to open an arrow up so they can have more breathing options and then you know rounding over stability ball for somebody who's wide and extended like i am is a really good way to get that zone of opposition there is actually a really good post by zach couples i will uh he's a physical therapist who kind of came out of the same um who's a, who, who's of the Bill, Bill Hartman school of, of thought, I guess the model of thought you might say. And he made a really good observation and I, and I agree with him hundred percent. You can clean up 85, 80 to 85% of people's issues as far as movement and as far as breathing by choosing the right exercises and get it using exercises that encourage the stack. Okay. If you go to a commercial gym and you walk in, if you ever meet me in person and we go hang out at a gym, um, you will see just about everyone either has a really flat T-spine, which means they're compressed, okay, or they're extended on everything they do. Every exercise they do, they're extended, and they're just driving this pattern even further, you know, extended on the squats, extended on the bench, and they never do anything that does the opposite of that. So they end up with this really stiff rib cage, and they can't breathe really effectively because of the strategy that they're in and nobody really addresses that strategy. And so they can try all the rest pauses. They can do all the breathing drills, the potato, all the good stuff, but until they have the variability in the structure itself to break out of that pattern, they're not going to see um, great results in their respiratory rate. And that's one of the reasons we use the aura ring one, because we like it in airplane mode. We don't like people walking around with devices broadcasting off them all day. And the respiratory rate is a really good way for me to see how much stress somebody's under and what kind of breathing mechanics they have without even looking at them. If I have someone who's got an 18, 19, 20, 21 respiratory rate, I know they're running around with their hair on fire. We need to bring that respiratory down rate down to 12, 14, 16. And so what happens is, is people get in this state of overbreathing, and that becomes their normal and they, they, they just can't shut it off. They don't know how to. Right. And so we can break that pattern by giving them some variability and also teaching them, you know, putting them on the floor, putting their feet on the wall in a 90 degree angle, putting one hand on the chest, one hand on the belly, having them take a breath. And most people will go, they'll actually lift themselves off the floor to breathe, but teaching them to get that good position the fact that they're on the floor takes gravity away and kind of allows things to kind of relax and open up and teaching them to breathe in so that the rib cage expands at the same rate as the belly. And then on the exhale, the belly drops first and the ribs follow, right? So it's breathe in, expand everywhere, front to back, in the sides, in the belly, in the low back, everything expands as a unit. And then as you exhale, the belly drops first and then the ribs come down. And just getting people to be aware of that really helps. And then giving them things that take them to the opposite extreme of where they're stuck. Most of the time when you have people that are having issues orthopedically or uh, movement issues, you have to take them to the opposite of where they're living in order to allow the brain and the body to kind of find that middle ground. And a lot of times the body kind of forgets and gets stuck. It's kind of like if you have a manual transmission, if you've ever driven stick, and a lot of people haven't, but if you've ever driven a manual transmission, imagine driving around with only first and second, right? And you don't have the other gears. So a lot of times that when we, we work with people, when I work with someone, I'm giving them back third, fourth, fifth gear, right? So they have options. So they're not driving around at 7,000 RPMs. Can you drive around at 7,000 RPMs? Yes but that's going to have long-term consequences um, revving your engine that high all the time. So uh, that's, that's basically the gist of it. I would say our modern life, if you want to read a great book on stress and how it affects us, uh, Robert Sapolsky's why zebras don't get ulcers, 
is incredible. It's on Audible, so it's it's a long book, but Sapolsky's great. All his lectures are on uh, YouTube from his uh, – he, he's a incredible guy. I really love listening to his lectures. He's, he, he's really entertaining, so – but yeah, our modern world has consequences, and and that's one of the reasons why we encourage people. Like after this call, you know, I've just spent thirty minutes talking, and why teachers and most people that coach and 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 talk a lot are so exhausted because you're basically when you're talking, you're breathing through your mouth and you're over breathing. So after this call, I'll take ten minutes. I'll go chill somewhere. I'll round slightly forward. I'll close my mouth, put the tongue in the roof of my mouth, and I'll just slow my breathing way down through my nose. And kind of shut things off and kind of shut off that excited state and have to do that a lot. I, I remember coaching, you know, big, big groups of athletes and being so exhausted after. And that's why you get a lot of strength coaches that get kind of hooked on energy drinks and caffeine because they're having to be on stage. You know, when like I used to joke all the time that that, uh, you know, being a strength and conditioning coach, especially in a group setting, is more like entertainment industry. You're having to entertain. You're after being engaging. You know, when I'm here talking to you on the call, if I was like, yeah, your breathing patterns are uh, affected by the way your sh shape of your rib cage and your where your pelvis is positioned. You know, I have to be engaging. I have to be entertaining or else you're not going to watch the video. Right. So there is a cost to that. And so you have to think about, um, you know, the harder I work, the harder I train, the more I need to work in. And so you need to, you need to have the two opposites. So you end up somewhere in the middle. Like I have a float tank session tonight that I'm going to, um, I do that once a week that takes me to the other extreme. You know, I spend a lot of time talking to people on zoom. I spend a lot of time, um, you know, doing group coaching with Dr. Stillman where you're talking to, you know, you know, 15, 10, 15 people for an hour and you're having to be totally engaged and totally focused. So I try and make sure I work things into my life where I have the opposite. I've got silence. I've got boredom. I've got relaxation. And that's one thing that our modern world has taken away from us, and particularly this damn thing, um, is never being bored, never being silent, never being quiet. So if you're living in a world that's constant noise, you've got to have the opposite of that. You've got to go into nature. You've got to calm down. You've got to be quiet. You've got to work these things into your life. If, if, if health is your goal. Now, if, if you're not concerned about your health, you know, just keep pushing. Um, but there's consequences with that. Everything is trade-offs. So you you got to stop thinking about right or wrong. You got to start thinking about trade-offs, right? So, you know, if you're trying to be healthy, if you're trying to, if you're trying to optimize body composition, you're probably not going to be able to go out and party till two o'clock in the morning and drink with your friends, right? You're going to have to come home. You're going to have to go to bed earlier. You know, you're not going to be able to eat tons and tons of processed foods. Um, you know, you're going to have to make choices and uh, depending on what your goals are and what you take as a priority. And a lot of people just want a free lunch. They want to take a pill or they want to take a peptide or they want to take a hormone and all those things have their place. You just got to understand that there's no free lunch. You know, if you want to have a healthy life, if you want to feel good, um, there's going to be things that you're going to need to do. And one of the things I had to do to get my health back in order was to stop working my early mornings in the gym indoors, canceled my morning sessions, started getting outside in the sun more. And now I've redesigned my life. So I spend 97% of my day outside. Okay. And that's for me, you know, I walked away from a, a very successful business. So I had hundreds of clients that uh, I loved working with. Um, that was what I wanted to do. And that's what I needed to do for myself. So a lot of times when you look at these things and that's what we do in our coaching services is help people walk them through and figure out what they need to prioritize, what they're willing to give up. And then, for example, if I have, you know, say I have somebody who's living an indoor life, they're insulin resistant, uh, they eat a lot of garbage, you know, I will say, Hey, let's take a week uh, let's take, let's take four weeks. Okay. Maybe even two, sometimes two is enough. And I'll say, let's start walking outside every day, three times a day for 10 minutes. Okay. Let's get the morning light. Let's do that. Let's get the lights off at night. And I want you to eat. I want you to pull out all the processed foods. I want you to eat basically meat and vegetables for a couple weeks. And then they tell me, they're like, I can't do this. I need to eat chocolate cake. I can't live without chocolate cake. I go, okay. 
Fair enough. We start lifting weights. Okay. Twice a week when you lift weights, you can have your chocolate cake after you lift weights because the weightlifting itself will mitigate some of the uh, side effects of the chocolate cake because you're taking it after strength training. You're going to be more insulin sensitive. You're going to soak up a lot of that glucose plus going outside, managing stress. And that way, if the chocolate cake is there, like, I'm not going to do any of this unless I can still eat chocolate cake. We can find a way to eat chocolate cake um, and still make it, you know, make your health improve, right? So if you're only eating chocolate cake twice a week after you train, that's not going to have a negative side effect on your health unless you're really in a really bad place. You've got like a crazy autoimmune disease or something like that. Um, but, you know, or if you're a tech person, you know, we, we work with a lot of people that are in tech. They have no choice. You know, we can get them to work outside on a balcony if they're working from home. That helps them. We can get them to hardwire their computer, which I'm plugged in right now, the ether, Ethernet. Um, we can get them to uh, get some red lights in their office. We can get them to wear blue blockers while they're on the screen. We can get them to develop an imaginary smoking habit uh, where they basically tell their boss, like, I've got to go outside. Like all the other smokers are going out every you know, hour and a half. You go out there for 10 or 15 minutes, you come back in. And for a lot of people, that's enough to get the needle going in the right direction and manage that until they can, you know, make and they might not need to make different choices but it's a matter of figuring out where people are and helping them figure out what they need to do to get the outcome that they want um that that's basically what we do in the coaching practice and it takes time to develop that and it gets time to get to know people and a lot of times what people overlook is you know why they're stuck in these patterns and why they can't eat stop eating certain things or why they can't stop with certain behaviors a lot of it is is the brain trying to keep the brain in a certain um i guess you would say pattern uh, and, and we do a deal a lot with this in in you know a neurofeedback and brain mapping and things like that they can identify that hey you're stuck your brain operates best when it's under stress and so if you're stuck in this like stress mode your body will actually do things in your everyday life to try and rev you up like nicotine or caffeine or, you know, sugary foods to try and rev yourself up um, to make you, because the brain has gotten comfortable being in this, this happens a lot with people with PTSD, um, the brain gets comfortable being in this stress state, and sometimes it needs some help, just like breathing mechanics, it needs a little nudge to help break the pattern and to help people learn how to be comfortable relaxing. I remember in the, uh, Late, like 2009, 2010, when I got colitis, I was so wound up. I was working so many hours. I was taking so many stimulants. I ended up getting colitis. It, it was almost impossible for me to sit still. I had to literally work really hard. to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit still here for one minute. And I remember, like, you know, having my foot go up and down. And, and my body just did not like relaxing. It took me probably three to six months with things like acupuncture and float tank. Like I used to get the float tank. I was so miserable. I'm like, my brain would be racing. I'd be like, what the hell's going on? Like I can't, you know, acupuncture, same thing. I would be on the table and I'd be worried about, oh, I need to do this. I need to do that. I couldn't shut off. It took deliberate effort and time for me to teach myself how to actually let go and relax. And once I did do that over time, it became one of the most, you know, enjoyable things it's the other extreme before my enjoyment was, you know, I'd lift that heavy weight and get that endorphin from that I'd get that high from that. Once I learned how to go to the complete opposite, I almost got the same effect, but in a relaxation state. And that was really hard work for me to get there. So a lot of people get into a pattern and they, it's just like when I introduce people a new strategy to pull them out of the strategy that they're stuck in, it could be a simple side plank on their left side with their knees curled up i call it c is c is for cookie um side plank and these are really really strong people but because that strategy is so foreign to them they go up in this modified side plank where they take their keep their knees on the floor I actually worked with a, a girl last night who i did this to and you could see that she's working really hard to stay in this really easy position or when you work with somebody who like a power lifter who's very extended you take them, you put them on the floor, you put their feet on a bench 
and you have them kind of flatten their back out. And then you basically put like a roller in between their knees. You have them exhale, you have them get their ribs down and then you have them gently squeeze that roller. These are people that are squatting 800 pounds plus deadlifting 800 pounds, benching massive amounts of weight. And you have them lift their feet off the bench a half an inch and pull their knees back a little bit. And it's almost like they're convulsing. They're shaking so hard because they just don't know how to not use that high threshold strategy. They're introducing something really that should be really easy for them. They can't do it because they're so stuck over here. So you need to do things with people like that, like people that are power lifters that are so stuck in this like locked in like strategy, which is great for lifting heavy things. You need to incorporate things in their warm up where they're flowing. They're doing bird dogs with no brace. You know, they're breathing calmly through the whole thing. The better you move, the, the, the better you breathe, the better you're going to be able to move your body. When you, when you brace, when you hold your breath, the more power you're going to be able to produce, the more weight you're going to be able to lift. So you have to be able to do some of both or you're going to end up in trouble. So that was a pretty good little ramble on there. And if anybody else, thank you so much, Amy and, and Shannon, for the comments and the questions. I appreciate that very much. Uh, I really enjoy getting on here, and I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're being more consistent. Obviously, the sun's come up, and I'm getting some good sweat going, a little glisten here. Dr. Stillman and I really enjoy uh, being on here and answering your questions. We'll be back here tomorrow. You can go into the live on either one of our YouTube uh, pages, and you can see what the topic is tomorrow. I think we're back to iodine again tomorrow. Um, and thank you, James. Really appreciate you tuning in every day. And thank you, Amy. And thank you, Shannon. I appreciate that so much. Um, we, uh, You can go in and see our topics. And in the next day or two, I'm going to be adding, you know, most of the topics for next month. And if, thank you, David. Good to see you. I'll see you at noon. Um, if you uh, have any suggestions about things we'd like to cover, uh, we'll, uh, we'll gladly do that for you. It can be, it can be non-health related. It could be business related. Um, thank you, Brooke. That's very nice of you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, we, we really enjoyed being on here. And, and um, it's been fun being consistent with this. And all of Dr. Stillman's Monday master classes will be on there as well. So you can look and see uh, what we got coming up. But you can check out our links in the link tree. You can check out uh, the coaching side of things at stillmanwellness.com. You can check out the medical side of things at Stillman MD. Uh, we have annual plans uh, that if you're in uh, Florida or if you're in New York, you can work with us on a monthly a monthly uh, payment where we'll look at your labs. We do lifestyle coaching as part of that as well. Um, if you don't live in either one of those two states, you can actually come see us here in person and I'll get to work with you a little bit. And we do an in-person physical. And that allows you to see to work with Dr. Stillman on the medical side of things as well. He's also adding several other states, uh, getting licensed to several other states. So that's a that's a great option. Uh, we've created uh, different plans to basically meet the needs of the people that have been contacting us, and so we can help we can help more people on a bigger scale. So thanks everyone for tuning in, and I will see you. Dr. Stillman will be back with us tomorrow from the great state of California. He's out there visiting some family. So have yourself a great day and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning.